section twelve of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain on the twenty fifth of february we quitted kupti and returned to nootka with much joy did thompson and myself again find ourselves in a place where notwithstanding the melancholy recollections which it excited we hoped before long to see some vessel arrive to our relief and for this we became the more solicitous as of late we had become much more apprehensive of our safety in consequence of information brought maquina a few days before we left kupti by some of the cayuquettes that there were twenty ships at the northward preparing to come against him with an intent of destroying him and his whole tribe for cutting off the boston this story which was wholly without foundation and discovered afterwards to have been invented by these people for the purpose of disquieting him threw him into great alarm and notwithstanding all i could say to convince him that it was an unfounded report so great was his jealousy of us especially after it had become confirmed to him by some others of the same nation that he treated us with much harshness and kept a very suspicious eye upon us nothing indeed could be more unpleasant than our present situation when i reflected that our lives were altogether dependent on the will of a savage on whose caprice and suspicions no rational calculation could be made not long after our return a son of maquina's sister a boy of eleven years old who had been for some time declining died immediately on his death which was about midnight all the men and women in the house set up loud cries and shrieks which awakening thompson and myself so disturbed us that we left the house this lamentation was kept up during the remainder of the night in the morning a great fire was kindled in which maquina burned in honor of the deceased ten fathoms of cloth and buried him with ten fathoms more eight of iwa four prime sea otter skins and two small trunks containing our unfortunate captain's clothes and watch this boy was considered as a tai or chief being the only son of tatouche one of the principal chiefs who had married maquina's sister whence arose this ceremony on his interment it being an established custom with these people that whenever a chief dies his most valuable property is burned or buried with him it is however wholly confined to the chiefs and appears to be a mark of honor appropriate to them in this instance maquina furnished the articles in order that his nephew might have the proper honors rendered him tatouche his father was esteemed the first warrior of the tribe and was one who had been particularly active in the destruction of our ship having killed two of our poor comrades who were ashore whose names were hall and wood about the time of our removal to tassis while in the enjoyment of the highest health he was suddenly seized with a fit of delirium in which he fancied that he saw the ghosts of these two men constantly standing by him and threatening him so that he would take no food except what was forced into his mouth a short time before this he had lost a daughter of about fifteen years of age which afflicted him greatly and whether his insanity a disorder very uncommon amongst these savages no instance of the kind having occurred within the memory of the oldest man amongst them proceeded from this cause or that it was the special interposition of an all-merciful god in our favor who by this means thought proper to induce these barbarians still further to respect our lives or that for hidden purposes the supreme disposer of events sometimes permits the spirits of the dead to revisit the world 
and haunt the murderer i know not but his mind from this period until his death which took place but a few weeks after that of his son was incessantly occupied with the images of the men whom he had killed this circumstance made much impression upon the tribe particularly the chiefs whose uniform opposition to putting us to death at the various councils that were held on our account i could not but in part attribute to this cause and maquina used frequently in speaking of tatusha's sickness to express much satisfaction that his hands had not been stained with the blood of any of our men when maquina was first informed by his sister of the strange conduct of her husband he immediately went to his house taking us with him suspecting that his disease had been caused by us and that the ghosts of our countrymen had been called thither by us to torment him we found him raving about hall and wood saying that they were peshak that is bad maquina then placed some provisions before him to see if he would eat on perceiving it he put forth his hand to take some but instantly withdrew it with signs of horror saying that hall and wood were there and would not let him eat maquina then pointing to us asked if it was not john and thompson who troubled him wick he replied that is no john clushish thompson clushish john and thompson are both good then turning to me and patting me on the shoulder he made signs to me to eat i tried to persuade him that hall and wood were not there and that none were near him but ourselves he said i know very well you do not see them but i do at first maquina endeavored to convince him that he saw nothing and to laugh him out of his belief but finding that all was to no purpose he at length became serious and asked me if i had ever seen any one afflicted in this manner and what was the matter with him i gave him to understand pointing to his head that his brain was injured and that he did not see things as formerly being convinced by tatusha's conduct that we had no agency in his indisposition on our return home maquina asked me what was done in my country in similar cases i told him that such persons were closely confined and sometimes tied up and whipped in order to make them better after pondering for some time he said that he should be glad to do anything to relieve him and that he should be whipped and immediately gave orders to some of his men to go to tatusha's house bind him and bring him to his in order to undergo the operation thompson was the person selected to administer this remedy which he undertook very readily and for that purpose provided himself with a good number of spruce branches with which he whipped him most severely laying it on with the best will imaginable while tatouche displayed the greatest rage kicking spitting and attempting to bite all who came near him this was too much for maquina who at length unable to endure it longer ordered thompson to desist and to touche to be carried back saying that if there was no other way of curing him but by whipping he must remain mad the application of the whip produced no beneficial effect on tatouche for he afterwards became still more deranged in his fits of fury sometimes seizing a club and beating his slaves in a most dreadful manner and striking and spitting at all who came near him till at length his wife no longer daring to remain in the house with him came with her son to maquina's the whaling season now commenced and maquina was out almost every day in his canoe in pursuit of them but for a considerable time with no success one day breaking the staff of his harpoon another after having been a long time fast to a whale the weapon drawing 
owing to the breaking of the shell which formed its point with several such like accidents arising from the imperfection of the instrument at these times he always returned very morose and out of temper upbraiding his men with having violated their obligation to continence preparatory to whaling in this state of ill humour he would give us very little to eat which added to the women not cooking when the men are away reduced us to a very low fare in consequence of the repeated occurrence of similar accidents i proposed to maquina to make him a harpoon or foreganger of steel which would be less liable to fail him the idea pleased him and in a short time i completed one for him with which he was much delighted and the very next day went out to make a trial of it he succeeded with it in taking a whale great was the joy throughout the village as soon as it was known that the king had secured a whale by notice from a person stationed in the headland in the offing all the canoes were immediately launched and furnished with harpoons and sealskin floats hastened to assist in buoying it up and towing it in the bringing in of this fish exhibited a scene of universal festivity as soon as the canoes appeared at the mouth of the cove those on board of them singing a triumph to a slow air to which they kept time with their paddles all who were on shore men women and children mounted the roofs of their houses to congratulate the king on his success drumming most furiously on the planks and exclaiming wokosh wokosh tai the whale on being drawn on shore was immediately cut up and a great feast of the blubber given at maquina's house to which all the village were invited who indemnified themselves for their lent by eating as usual to excess i was highly praised for the goodness of my harpoon and a quantity of blubber given me which i was permitted to cook as i pleased this i boiled in salt water with some young nettles and other greens for thompson and myself and in this way we found it tolerable food their method of procuring the oil is to skim it from the water in which the blubber is boiled and when cool put it up into whale bladders for use and of these i have seen them so large as when filled would require no less than five or six men to carry several of the chiefs among whom were maquina's brothers who after the king has caught the first whale are privileged to take them also were very desirous on discovering the superiority of my harpoon that i should make some for them but this maquina would not permit reserving for himself this improved weapon he however gave me directions to make a number more for himself which i executed and also made him several lances with which he was greatly pleased as these people have some very singular observances preparatory to whaling an account of them will i presume not prove uninteresting especially as it may serve to give a better idea of their manners a short time before leaving tassis the king makes a point of passing a day alone on the mountain whither he goes very privately early in the morning and does not return till late in the evening this is done as i afterwards learned for the purpose of singing and praying to his god for success in whaling the ensuing season at kupti the same ceremony is performed and at nutka after the return thither with still greater solemnity as for the next two days he appears very thoughtful and gloomy scarcely speaking to any one and observes a most rigid fast on these occasions he has always a broad red fillet made of bark bound round his head in token of humiliation with a large branch of green spruce on the top and his great rattle in his hand in addition to this for a week before commencing their whaling 
both himself and the crew of his canoe observe a fast eating but very little and going into the water several times in the course of each day to bathe singing and rubbing their bodies limbs and faces with shells and bushes so that on their return i have seen them look as though they had been severely torn with briars they are likewise obliged to abstain from any commerce with their women for the like period the latter restriction being considered as indispensable to their success early in june tatouche the crazy chief died on being acquainted with his death the whole village men women and children set up a loud cry with every testimony of the greatest grief which they continued for more than three hours as soon as he was dead the body according to their custom was laid out on a plank having the head bound round with a red bark fillet which is with them an emblem of mourning and sorrow after laying some time in this manner he was wrapped in an otter skin robe and three fathoms of iwa being put about his neck he was placed in a large coffin or box of about three feet deep which was ornamented on the outside with two rows of the small white shells in this the most valuable articles of his property were placed with him among which were no less than twenty-four prime sea otter skins at night which is their time for interring the dead the coffin was borne by eight men with two poles thrust through ropes passed around it to the place of burial accompanied by his wife and family with their hair cut short in token of grief all the inhabitants joining the procession the place of burial was a large cavern on the side of a hill at a little distance from the village in which after depositing the coffin carefully all the attendants repaired to maquina's house where a number of articles belonging to the deceased consisting of blankets pieces of cloth etc were burned by a person appointed by maquina for that purpose dressed and painted in the highest style with his head covered with white down who as he puts in the several pieces one by one poured upon them a quantity of oil to increase the flame in the intervals between making a speech and playing off a variety of buffoon tricks and the whole closed with a feast and a dance from satsatsaxis the king's son the man who performed the ceremony of burning on this occasion was a very singular character named kinniclimits he was held in high estimation by the king though only of the common class probably from his talent for mimicry and buffoonery and might be considered as a kind of king's jester or rather as combining in his person the character of a buffoon with that of master of ceremonies and public orator to his majesty as he was the one who at feasts always regulated the places of the guests delivered speeches on receiving or returning visits besides amusing the company at all their entertainments with a variety of monkey pranks and antic gestures which appeared to these savages the height of wit and humour but would be considered as extremely low by the least polished people almost all the kings or head chiefs of the principal tribes were accompanied by a similar character who appeared to be attached to their dignity and are called in their language Klimmer Habi. this man kinniclimits was particularly odious to thompson who would never join in the laugh at his tricks but when he began would almost always quit the house with a very surly look and an exclamation of cursed fool which maquina who thought nothing could equal the cleverness of his Klimmer Habi, used to remark with much dissatisfaction asking me why thompson never laughed observing that i must have had a very good-tempered woman indeed for my mother as my father was so very ill-natured a man among those performances that gained him the greatest applause was his talent of eating to excess 
for i have known him devour at one meal no less than seventy-five large herrings and at another time when a great feast was given by maquina he undertook after drinking three pints of oil by way of a whet to eat four dried salmon and five quarts of spawn mixed up with a gallon of train oil and actually succeeded in swallowing the greater part of this mess until his stomach became so overloaded as to discharge its contents in the dish one of his exhibitions however had nearly cost him his life this was on the occasion of kla kwak ina one of the chiefs having bought him a new wife in celebration of which he ran three times through a large fire and burned himself in such a manner that he was not able to stir for more than four weeks these feats of savage skill were much praised by maquina who never failed to make him presents of cloth muskets etc on such occasions the death of tatouche increased still more the disquietude which his delirium had excited among the savages and all those chiefs who had killed our men became much alarmed lest they should be seized with the same disorder and die like him more particularly as i had told maquina that i believed his insanity was a punishment inflicted on him by quahoots for his cruelty in murdering two innocent men who had never injured him End of section 12section thirteen of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain our situation had now become unpleasant in the extreme the summer was so far advanced that we nearly despaired of a ship arriving to our relief and with that expectation almost relinquished the hope of ever having it in our power to quit this savage land we were treated too with less indulgence than before both thompson and myself being obliged in addition to our other employments to perform the laborious task of cutting and collecting fuel which we had to bring on our shoulders from nearly three miles distance as it consisted wholly of dry trees all of which near the village had been consumed to add to this we suffered much abuse from the common people who when maquina or some of the chiefs were not present would insult us calling us wretched slaves asking us where was our tyee or captain making gestures signifying that his head had been cut off and that they would do the like to us though they generally took good care at such times to keep well out of thompson's reach as they had more than once experienced to their cost the strength of his fist this conduct was not only provoking and grating to our feelings in the highest degree but it convinced us of the ill disposition of these savages towards us and rendered us fearful lest they might at some time or other persuade or force maquina and the chiefs to put us to death we were also often brought to great distress for the want of provisions so far as to be reduced to collect a scanty supply of mussels and limpets from the rocks and sometimes even compelled to part with some of our most necessary articles of clothing in order to purchase food for our subsistence this was however principally owing to the inhabitants themselves experiencing a great scarcity of provisions this season there having been in the first place but very few salmon caught at friendly cove a most unusual circumstance as they generally abound there in the spring which was by the natives attributed to their having been driven away by the blood of our men who had been thrown into the sea which with true savage inconsistency excited their murmurs against maquina who had proposed cutting off our ship relying on this supply they had in the most inconsiderate manner 
squandered away their winter stock of provisions so that in a few days after their return it was entirely expended nor were the king and the chiefs much more fortunate in their whaling even after i had furnished maquina with the improved weapon for that purpose but four whales having been taken during the season which closes the last of may including one that had been struck by maquina and escaped and was afterwards driven on shore about six miles from nootka in almost a state of putridity these afforded but a short supply to a population including all ages and sexes of no less than fifteen hundred persons and of a character so very improvident that after feasting most gluttonously whenever a whale was caught they were several times for a week together reduced to the necessity of eating but once a day and of collecting cockles and mussels from the rocks for their food and even after the cod and halibut fishing commenced in june in which they met with tolerable success such was the savage caprice of maquina that he would often give us but little to eat finally ordering us to buy a canoe and fishing implements and go out ourselves and fish or we should have nothing to do this we were compelled to part with our great coats which were not only important to us as garments but of which we made our beds spreading them under us when we slept from our want of skill however in this new employ we met with no success on discovering which maquina ordered us to remain at home another thing which to me in particular proved an almost constant source of vexation and disgust and which living among them had not in the least reconciled me to was their extreme filthiness not only in eating fish especially the whale when in a state of offensive putridity but while at their meals of making a practice of taking the vermin from their heads or clothes and eating them by turns thrusting their fingers into their hair and into the dish and spreading their garments over the tubs in which the provision was cooking in order to set in motion their inhabitants fortunately for thompson he regarded this much less than myself and when i used to point out to him any instance of their filthiness in this respect he would laugh and reply never mind john the more good things the better i must however do maquina the justice to state that he was much neater both in his person and eating than were the others as was likewise his queen owing no doubt to his intercourse with foreigners which had given him ideas of cleanliness for i never saw either of them eat any of these animals but on the contrary they appeared not much to relish this taste in others their garments also were much cleaner maquina having been accustomed to give his away when they became soiled till after he discovered that thompson and myself kept ours clean by washing them when he used to make thompson do the same for him yet amidst this state of endurance and disappointment in hearing repeatedly of the arrival of ships at the north and south most of which proved to be idle reports while expectation was almost wearied out in looking for them we did not wholly despond relying on the mercy of the supreme being to offer up to whom our devotions on the days appointed for his worship was our chief consolation and support though we were sometimes obliged by our task masters to infringe upon the sabbath which was to me a source of much regret we were nevertheless treated at times with much kindness by maquina who would give us a plenty of the best that he had to eat and occasionally some small present of cloth for a garment promising me that if any ship should arrive within a hundred miles of nootka he would send a canoe with a letter from me to the captain so that he might come to our release these flattering promises and marks of attention were however at those times when he thought himself in personal danger from a mutinous spirit which the scarcity of provisions had excited among the natives who like true savages 
imputed all their public calamities of whatever kind to the misconduct of their chief or when he was apprehensive of an attack from some of the other tribes who were irritated with him for cutting off the boston as it had prevented ships from coming to trade with them and were constantly alarming him with idle stories of vessels that were preparing to come against him and exterminate both him and his people at such times he made us keep guard over him both night and day armed with cutlasses and pistols being apparently afraid to trust any of his own men at one time it was a general revolt of his people that he apprehended then three of his principal chiefs among whom was his elder brother had conspired to take away his life and at length he fancied that a small party of clauquats between whom and the nootkians little friendship subsisted had come to nootka under a pretense of trade for the sole purpose of murdering him and his family telling us probably to sharpen our vigilance that their intention was to kill us likewise and so strongly were his fears excited on this occasion that he not only ordered us to keep near him armed by day whenever he went out and to patrol at night before his house while they remained but to continue the same guard for three days after they were gone and to fire at one and at four in the morning one of the great guns to let them know if as he suspected they were lurking in the neighborhood that he was on his guard while he was thus favorably disposed toward us i took an opportunity to inform him of the ill treatment that we frequently received from his people and the insults that were offered us by some of the stranger tribes in calling us white slaves and loading us with other opprobrious terms he was much displeased and said that his subjects should not be allowed to treat us ill and that if any of the strangers did it he wished us to punish the offenders with death at the same time directing us for our security to go constantly armed this permission was soon improved by thompson to the best advantage for a few days after having gone to the pond to wash some of our clothes and blanket for maquina several wiccaninish who were then at nootka came thither and seeing him washing the clothes and the blanket spread upon the grass to dry they began according to custom to insult him and one of them bolder than the others walked over the blanket thompson was highly incensed and threatened the indian with death if he repeated the offence but he in contempt of the threat trampled upon the blanket when drawing his cutlass without further ceremony thompson cut off his head on seeing which the others ran off at full speed thompson then gathering up the clothes and blanket on which were the marks of the indian's dirty feet and taking with him the head returned and informed the king of what had passed who was much pleased and highly commended his conduct this had a favorable effect for us not only on the stranger tribes but the inhabitants themselves who treated us afterwards with less disrespect in the latter part of july maquina informed me that he was going to war with the a e charts a tribe about fifty miles to the south on account of some controversy that had arisen the preceding summer and that i must make a number of daggers for his men and chitulfs for his chiefs which having completed he wished me to make for his own use a weapon of quite a different form in order to dispatch his enemy by one blow on the head it being the calculation of these nations on going to war to surprise their adversaries while asleep this was a steel dagger or more properly a spike of about six inches long made very sharp set at right angles in an iron handle of fifteen inches long terminating at the lower end in a crook or turn so as to prevent its being wrenched from the hand and at the upper in a round knob or head from whence the spike protruded this instrument i polished highly 
and the more to please maquina formed on the back of the knob the resemblance of a man's head with the mouth open substituting for eyes black beads which i fastened in with red sealing wax this pleased him much and was greatly admired by his chiefs who wanted me to make similar ones for them but maquina would not suffer it reserving for himself alone this weapon when these people have finally determined on war they make it an invariable practice for three or four weeks prior to the expedition to go into the water five or six times a day when they wash and scrub themselves from head to foot with bushes intermixed with briars so that their bodies and faces will often be entirely covered with blood during this severe exercise they are continually exclaiming wokash quahoots tichame a wealth wik etish tau ilf kar sab matemas wiksish tu hak matemas i ya ish ka shittle a smooth tish war rich matemas which signifies good or great god let me live not be sick find the enemy not fear him find him asleep and kill a great many of them during the whole of this period they have no intercourse with their women and for a week before setting out abstain from feasting or any kind of merriment appearing thoughtful gloomy and morose and for the three last days are almost constantly in the water both by day and night scrubbing and lacerating themselves in a terrible manner maquina having informed thompson and myself that he should take us with him was very solicitous that we should bathe and scrub ourselves in the same way with them telling me that it would harden our skins so that the weapons of the enemy would not pierce them but as we felt no great inclination to amuse ourselves in this manner we declined it the expedition consisted of forty canoes carrying from ten to twenty men each thompson and myself armed ourselves with cutlasses and pistols but the natives although they had a plenty of european arms took with them only their daggers and chitulths with a few bows and arrows the latter being about a yard in length and pointed with copper mussel shell or bone the bows are four feet and a half long with strings made of whale sinew to go to a e chart we ascended from twenty to thirty miles a river about the size of that of tassis the banks of which are high and covered with wood at midnight we came in sight of the village which was situated on the west bank near the shore on a steep hill difficult of access and well calculated for defence it consisted of fifteen or sixteen houses smaller than those at nootka and built in the same style but compactly placed by maquina's directions the attack was deferred until the first appearance of dawn as he said that was the time when men slept the soundest at length all being ready for the attack we landed with the greatest silence and going around so as to come upon the foe in the rear clambered up the hill and while the natives as is their custom entered the several huts creeping on all fours my comrade and myself stationed ourselves without to intercept those who should attempt to escape or come to the aid of their friends i wished if possible not to stain my hands in the blood of any fellow-creature and though thompson would gladly have put to death all the savages in the country he was too brave to think of attacking a sleeping enemy having entered the houses on the war-whoop being given by maquina as he seized the head of the chief and gave him the fatal blow all proceeded to the work of death the a e charts being thus surprised were unable to make resistance and with the exception of a very few who were so fortunate as to make their escape were all killed or taken prisoners on condition of becoming slaves to their captors i had the good fortune to take four captives whom maquina as a favour permitted me to consider as mine 
and occasionally employ them in fishing for me as for thompson who thirsted for revenge he had no wish to take any prisoners but with his cutlass the only weapon he would employ against them succeeded in killing seven stout fellows who came to attack him an act which obtained him great credit with maquina and the chiefs who after this held him in much higher estimation and gave him the appellation of chiil sumahar it being the name of a very celebrated warrior of their nation in ancient times whose exploits were the constant theme of their praise after having put to death all the old and infirm of either sex as is the barbarous practice of these people and destroyed the buildings we re-embarked with our booty in our canoes for nootka where we were received with great demonstrations of joy by the women and children accompanying our war-song with a most furious drumming on the houses the next day a great feast was given by maquina in celebration of his victory which was terminated as usual with a dance by satsatsaxis repeated applications had been made to maquina by a number of kings or chiefs to purchase me especially after he had showed them the harpoon i had made for him which he took much pride in but he constantly refused to part with me on any terms among these the king of the wiccaninish was particularly solicitous to obtain me having twice applied to maquina for that purpose once in a very formal manner by sending his messenger with four canoes who as he approached the shore decorated in their highest style with the white down on his head etc declared that he came to buy to johannes the name by which i was known to them for his master and that he had brought for that purpose four young male slaves two highly ornamented canoes such a number of the skins of metamelth and of the courtlock or sea otter and so many fathoms of cloth and ewa while as he mentioned the different articles they were pointed out or held up by his attendants but even this tempting offer had no influence on maquina who in the latter part of the summer was again very strongly urged to sell me by ulatilla or as he is generally called machi ulatilla chief of the klaitsarts who had come to nootka on a visit this chief who could speak tolerable english had much more the appearance of a civilized man than any of the savages that i saw he appeared to be about thirty was rather small in his person but extremely well formed with a skin almost as fair as that of an european good features and a countenance expressive of candor and amiableness and which was almost always brightened with a smile he was much neater both in his dress and person than any of the other chiefs seldom wearing paint except upon his eyebrows which after the custom of his country were plucked out and a few strips of the pelpeth on the lower part of his face he always treated me with much kindness was fond of conversing with me in english and in his own language asking me many questions relative to my country its manners customs etc and appeared to take a strong interest in my fate telling me that if he could persuade maquina to part with me he would put me on board the first ship that came to his country a promise which from his subsequent conduct i have good reason to think he would have performed as my deliverance at length from captivity and suffering was under the favour of divine providence wholly owing to him the only letter that ever reached an european or american vessel out of sixteen that i wrote at different times and sent to various parts of the coast having been delivered by him in person so much pleased was i with this man's behaviour to me while at nootka that i made for him a chitulth which i burnished highly and engraved with figures with this he was greatly delighted i also would have made for him a harpoon would maquina have consented with hearts full of dejection and almost lost to hope 
no ship having appeared off nootka this season did my companion and myself accompany the tribe on their removal in september to tassis relinquishing in consequence for six months even the remotest expectation of relief End of section thirteen section fourteen of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain soon after our establishment there maquina informed me that he and his chiefs had held a council both before and after quitting nootka in which they had determined that i must marry one of their women urging as a reason to induce me to consent that as there was now no probability of a ship coming to nootka to release me that i must consider myself as destined to pass the remainder of my life with them that the sooner i conformed to their customs the better and that a wife and family would render me more contented and satisfied with their mode of living i remonstrated against this decision but to no purpose for he told me that should i refuse both thompson and myself would be put to death telling me however that if there were none of the women of his tribe that pleased me he would go with me to some of the other tribes where he would purchase for me such a one as i should select reduced to this sad extremity with death on the one side and matrimony on the other i thought proper to choose what appeared to me the least of the two evils and consent to be married on condition that as i did not fancy any of the nootka women i should be permitted to make choice of one from some other tribe this being settled the next morning by daylight maquina with about fifty men in two canoes set out with me for Aititzart, taking with him a quantity of cloth a number of muskets sea otter skins etc for the purchase of my bride with the aid of our paddles and sails being favoured with a fair breeze we arrived some time before sunset at the village our arrival excited a general alarm and the men hastened to the shore armed with the weapons of their country making many warlike demonstrations and displaying much zeal and activity we in the meantime remained quietly seated in our canoes where we remained for about half an hour when the messenger of the chief dressed in their best manner came to welcome us and invite us on shore to eat we followed him in procession to the chief's house maquina at our head taking care to leave a sufficient number in the boats to protect the property when we came to the house we were ushered in with much ceremony and our respective seats pointed out to us mine being next to maquina by his request after having been regaled with a feast of herring spawn and oil maquina asked me if i saw any among the women who were present that i liked i immediately pointed out to a young girl of about seventeen the daughter of Upquesta, the chief who was sitting near him by her mother on this maquina making a sign to his men arose and taking me by the hand walked into the middle of the room and sent off two of his men to bring the boxes containing the presents from the canoes in the meantime kinniclimits the master of ceremonies whom i have already spoken of made himself ready for the part he was to act by powdering his hair with white down when the chests were brought in specimens of the several articles were taken out and showed by our men one of whom held up a musket another a skin a third a piece of cloth etc on this kinney clements stepped forward and addressing the chief informed him that all these belonged to me mentioning the number of each kind and that they were offered to him for the purchase of his daughter ustach ik equa as a wife for me as he said this 
the men who held up the various articles walked up to the chief and with a very stern and morose look the complimentary one on these occasions threw them at his feet immediately on which all the tribe both men and women who were assembled on this occasion set up a cry of clacko tai that is thank ye chief his men after this ceremony having returned to their places maquina rose and in a speech of more than half an hour said much in my praise to the aititsart chief telling him that i was as good a man as themselves differing from them only in being white that i was besides acquainted with many things of which they were ignorant that i knew how to make daggers chitulths and harpoons and was a very valuable person whom he was determined to keep always with him praising me at the same time for the goodness of my temper and the manner in which i had conducted myself since i had been with them observing that all the people of nootka and even the children loved me while maquina was speaking his master of ceremonies was continually skipping about making the most extravagant gestures and exclaiming wokash when he had ceased the Atitsar chief arose amidst the acclamations of his people and began with setting forth the many good qualities and accomplishments of his daughter that he loved her greatly and as she was his only one he could not think of parting with her he spoke in this manner for some time but finally concluded by consenting to the proposed union requesting that she might be well used and kindly treated by her husband at the close of this speech when the chief began to manifest a disposition to consent to our union kinney clements again began to call out as loud as he could bawl wokash cutting a thousand capers and spinning himself around on his heel like a top when uquesta had finished his speech he directed his people to carry back the presents which maquina had given to him to me together with two young male slaves to assist me in fishing these after having been placed before me were by maquina's men taken on board the canoes this ceremony being over we were invited by one of the principal chiefs to a feast at his house of clusamet or dried herring where after the eating was over kinney clements amused the company very highly with his tricks and the evening's entertainment was closed by a new war song from our men and one in return from the aititsarts accompanied with expressive gestures and wielding of their weapons after this our company returned to lodge at uquesta's except a few who were left on board the canoes to watch the property in the morning i received from the chief his daughter with an earnest request that i would see her well which i promised him when taking leave of her parents she accompanied me with apparent satisfaction on board of the canoe the wind being ahead the natives were obliged to have recourse to their paddles accompanying them with their songs interspersed with the witticisms and buffoonery of kinneclements who in his capacity of king's steersman one of his functions which i forgot to enumerate not only guided the course of the canoe but regulated the singing of the boatmen at about five in the morning we reached tassis where we found all the inhabitants collected on the shore to receive us we were welcomed with loud shouts of joy and exclamations of wokash and the women taking my bride under their charge conducted her to maquina's house to be kept with them for ten days it being a universal custom as maquina informed me that no intercourse should take place between the new married pair during that period at night maquina gave a great feast which was succeeded by a dance in which all the women joined and thus ended the festivities of my marriage the term of my probation being over maquina assigned me an apartment the space in the upper part of his house between him and his elder brother 
whose room was opposite here i established myself with my family consisting of myself and wife thompson and the little satsatsaksis who had always been strongly attached to me and now solicited his father to let him live with me to which he consented this boy was handsome extremely well formed amiable and of a pleasant sprightly disposition i used to take a pleasure in decorating him with rings bracelets ear jewels etc which i made for him of copper and ornamented and polished them in my best manner i was also very careful to keep him free from vermin of every kind washing him and combing his hair every day these marks of attention were not only very pleasing to the child who delighted in being kept neat and clean as well as in being dressed off in his finery but was highly gratifying both to maquina and his queen who used to express much satisfaction at my care of him in making my domestic establishment i determined as far as possible to live in a more comfortable and cleanly manner than the others for this purpose i erected with planks a partition of about three feet in height between mine and the adjoining rooms and made three bedsteads of the same which i covered with boards for my family to sleep on which i found much more comfortable than sleeping on the floor amidst the dirt fortunately i found my indian princess both amiable and intelligent for one whose limited sphere of observation must necessarily give rise to but a few ideas she was extremely ready to agree to anything that i proposed relative to our mode of living was very attentive in keeping her garments and her person neat and clean and appeared in every respect solicitous to please me she was as i have said about seventeen her person was small but well formed as were her features her complexion was without exception fairer than any of the women with considerable colour in her cheeks her hair long black and much softer than is usual with them and her teeth small even and of a dazzling whiteness while the expression of her countenance indicated sweetness of temper and modesty she would indeed have been considered as very pretty in any country and excepting maquina's queen was by far the handsomest of any of their women with a partner possessing so many attractions many may be apt to conclude that i must have found myself happy at least comparatively so but far otherwise was it with me a compulsory marriage with the most beautiful and accomplished person in the world can never prove a source of real happiness and in my situation i could not but view this connection as a chain that was to bind me down to this savage land and prevent my ever again seeing a civilized country especially when in a few days after maquina informed me that there had been a meeting of his chiefs in which it had been determined that as i had married one of their women i must be considered as one of them and conform to their customs and that in future neither myself nor thompson should wear our european clothes but dress in cutsacks like themselves this order was to me most painful but i persuaded maquina at length so far to relax in it as to permit me to wear those i had at present which were almost worn out and not to compel thompson to change his dress observing that as he was an old man such a change would cause his death their religious celebration which the last year took place in december was in this commenced on the fifteenth of november and continued for fourteen days as i was now considered as one of them instead of being ordered to the woods maquina directed thompson and myself to remain and pray with them to quahoots to be good to them and thank him for what he had done it was opened in much the same manner as the former after which all the men and women in the village assembled at maquina's house in their plainest dresses 
and without any kind of ornaments about them having their heads bound round with the red fillet a token of dejection and humiliation and their countenances expressive of seriousness and melancholy the performances during the continuance of this celebration consisted almost wholly in singing a number of songs to mournful airs the king regulating the time by beating on his hollow plank or drum accompanied by one of his chiefs seated near him with the great rattle in the meantime they eat but seldom and then very little retiring to sleep late and rising at the first appearance of dawn and even interrupting this short period of repose by getting up at midnight and singing the ceremony was terminated by an exhibition of a similar character to the one of the last year but still more cruel a boy of twelve years old with six bayonets run into his flesh one through each arm and thigh and through each side close to the ribs was carried around the room suspended upon them without manifesting any symptoms of pain maquina on my inquiring the reason of this display informed me that it was an ancient custom of his nation to sacrifice a man at the close of this solemnity in honor of their god but that his father had abolished it and substituted this in its place the whole closed on the evening of the twenty ninth with a great feast of salmon spawn and oil at which the natives as usual made up for their late abstinence a few days after a circumstance occurred which from its singularity i cannot forbear mentioning i was sent for by my neighbour yelf lower the king's elder brother to file his teeth which operation having performed he informed me that a new wife whom he had a little time before purchased having refused to sleep with him it was his intention provided she persisted in her refusal to bite off her nose i endeavoured to dissuade him from it but he was determined and in fact performed his savage threat that very night saying that since she would not be his wife she should not be that of any other and in the morning sent her back to her father this inhuman act did not however proceed from any innate cruelty of disposition or malice as he was far from being of a barbarous temper but such is the despotism exercised by these savages over their women that he no doubt considered it as a just punishment for her offence in being so obstinate and perverse as he afterwards told me that in similar cases the husband had a right with them to disfigure his wife in this way or some other to prevent her ever marrying again about the middle of december we left tassus for kupti as usual at this season we found the herrings in great plenty and here the same scene of riotous feasting that i witnessed last year was renewed by our improvident natives who in addition to their usual fare had a plentiful supply of wild geese which were brought to us in great quantity by the esquats these as maquina informed me were caught with nets made from bark in the fresh waters of that country those who take them make choice for that purpose of a dark and rainy night and with their canoes stuck with lighted torches proceed with as little noise as possible to the place where the geese are collected who dazzled by the light suffer themselves to be approached very near when the net is thrown over them and in this manner from fifty to sixty or even more will sometimes be taken at one cast on the fifteenth of january eighteen o five about midnight i was thrown into considerable alarm in consequence of an eclipse of the moon being awakened from my sleep by a great outcry of the inhabitants on going to discover the cause of this tumult i found them all out of their houses 
bearing lighted torches singing and beating upon pieces of plank and when i asked them the reason of this proceeding they pointed to the moon and said that a great codfish was endeavouring to swallow her and that they were driving him away the origin of this superstition i could not discover though in some respects my situation was rendered more comfortable since my marriage as i lived in a more cleanly manner and had my food better and more neatly cooked of which besides i had always a plenty my slaves generally furnishing me and upquesta never failing to send me an ample supply by the canoes that came from Itizart. still from my being obliged at this season of the year to change my accustomed clothing and to dress like the natives with only a piece of cloth of about two yards long thrown loosely around me my european clothes having been for some time entirely worn out i suffered more than i can express from the cold especially as i was compelled to perform the laborious task of cutting and bringing the firewood which was rendered still more oppressive to me from my comrade for a considerable part of the winter not having it in his power to lend me his aid in consequence of an attack of the rheumatism in one of his knees with which he suffered for more than four months two or three weeks of which he was so ill as to be under the necessity to leave the house this state of suffering with the little hope i now had of ever escaping from the savages began to render my life irksome to me still however i lost not my confidence in the aid of the supreme being to whom whenever the weather and a suspension from the tasks imposed on me would permit i never failed regularly on sundays to retire to the wood to worship taking thompson with me when he was able to go End of section fourteen section fifteen of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain on the twentieth of february we returned to our summer quarters at nootka but on my part with far different sensations than the last spring being now almost in despair of any vessel arriving to release us or our being permitted to depart if there should soon after our return as preparatory to the whaling season maquina ordered me to make a good number of harpoons for himself and his chiefs several of which i had completed with some lances when on the sixteenth of march i was taken very ill with a violent colic caused i presume from having suffered so much from the cold in going without proper clothing for a number of hours i was in great pain and expected to die and on its leaving me i was so weak as scarcely to be able to stand while i had nothing comforting to take nor anything to drink but cold water on the following day a slave belonging to maquina died and was immediately as is their custom in such cases tossed unceremoniously out of doors from whence he was taken by some others and thrown into the water the treatment of this poor creature made a melancholy impression upon my mind as i could not but think that such probably would be my fate should i die among these heathens and so far from receiving a decent burial that i should not even be allowed the common privilege of having a little earth thrown over my remains the feebleness in which the violent attack of my disorder had left me the dejection i felt at the almost hopelessness of my situation and the want of warm clothing and proper nursing though my indian wife as far as she knew how was always ready even solicitous to do everything for me she could still kept me very much indisposed which maquina perceiving he finally told me that if i did not like living with my wife and that was the cause of my being so sad i might part with her 
this proposal i readily accepted and the next day maquina sent her back to her father on parting with me she discovered much emotion begging me that i would suffer her to remain till i had recovered as there was no one who would take so good care of me as herself but when i told her she must go for that i did not think i should ever get well which in truth i but little expected and that her father would take good care of her and treat her much more kindly than maquina she took an affectionate leave telling me that she hoped i should soon get better and left her two slaves to take care of me though i rejoiced at her departure i was greatly affected with the simple expressions of her regard for me and could not but feel strongly interested for this poor girl who in all her conduct towards me had discovered so much mildness and attention to my wishes and had it not been that i considered her as an almost insuperable obstacle to my being permitted to leave the country i should no doubt have felt the deprivation of her society a real loss after her departure i requested maquina that as i had parted with my wife he would permit me to resume my european dress as otherwise from not having been accustomed to dress like them i should certainly die to this he consented and i once more became comfortably clad change of clothing but more than all the hopes which i now began to indulge that in the course of the summer i should be able to escape in a short time restored me to health so far that i could again go to work in making harpoons for maquina who probably fearing that he should have to part with me determined to provide himself with a good stock i shall not however long detain the reader with a detail of occurrences that intervened between this period and that of my escape which from that dull uniformity that marks the savage life would be in a measure but a repetition nor dwell upon that mental torture i endured from a constant conflict of hope and fear when the former almost wearied out with repeated disappointment offered to our sinking hearts no prospect of release but death to which we were constantly exposed from the brutal ignorance and savage disposition of the common people who in the various councils that were held this season to determine what to do with us in case of the arrival of a ship were almost always for putting us to death expecting by that means to conceal the murder of our crew and to throw the blame of it on some other tribe these barbarous sentiments were however universally opposed by maquina and his chiefs who would not consent to our being injured but as some of their customs and traits of national character which i think deserving of notice have not been mentioned i shall proceed to give an account of them the office of king or chief is with these people hereditary and descends to the eldest son or in failure of male issue to the elder brother who in the regal line is considered as the second person in the kingdom at feasts as i have observed the king is always placed in the highest or seat of honour and the chiefs according to their respective ranks which appear in general to be determined by their affinity to the royal family they are also designated by the embellishments of their mantles or kutsaks the king or head tai is their leader in war in the management of which he is perfectly absolute he is also president of their councils which are almost always regulated by his opinion but he has no kind of power over the property of his subjects nor can he require them to contribute to his wants being in this respect no more privileged than any other person he has in common with his chiefs the right to holding slaves which is not enjoyed by private individuals a regulation probably arising from their having been originally captives taken in battle the spoils of war being understood as appertaining to the king 
who receives and apportions them among his several chiefs and warriors according to their rank and deserts in conformity with this idea the plunder of the boston was all deposited in maquina's house who distributed part of it among his chiefs according to their respective ranks or degree of favor with him giving to one three hundred muskets to another one hundred and fifty with other things in like proportion the king is however obliged to support his dignity by making frequent entertainments and whenever he receives a large supply of provision he must invite all the men of his tribe to his house to eat it up otherwise as maquina told me he would not be considered as conducting like a tyee and would be no more thought of than a common man with regard to their religion they believe in the existence of a supreme being whom they call quahoots and who to use maquina's expression was one great tyee in the sky who gave them their fish and could take them from them and was the greatest of all kings their usual place of worship appeared to be the water for whenever they bathed they addressed some words in form of prayer to the god above entreating that he would preserve them in health give them good success in fishing etc these prayers were repeated with much more energy on preparing for whaling or for war as i have already mentioned some of them would sometimes go several miles to bathe in order to do it in secret the reason for this i could never learn though i am induced to think it was in consequence of some family or private quarrel and that they did not wish what they said to be heard while at other times they would repair in the same secret manner to the woods to pray this was more particularly the case with the women who might also have been prompted by a sentiment of decency to retire for the purpose of bathing as they are remarkably modest i once found one of our women more than two miles from the village on her knees in the woods with her eyes shut and her face turned towards heaven uttering words in a lamentable tone among which i distinctly heard wokash ah wealth meaning good lord and which has nearly the same signification with quahoots though i came very near her she appeared not to notice me but continued her devotions and i have frequently seen the women go alone into the woods evidently for the purpose of addressing themselves to a superior being and it was always very perceptible on their return when they had been thus employed from their silence and melancholy looks they have no belief however in a state of future existence as i discovered in conversation with maquina at tatusha's death on my attempting to convince him that he still existed and that he would again see him after his death but he could comprehend nothing of it and pointing to the ground said that there was the end of him and that he was like that nor do they believe in ghosts notwithstanding the case of tatouche would appear to contradict this assertion but that was a remarkable instance and such a one as had never been known to occur before yet from the mummeries performed over the sick it is very apparent that they believe in the agency of spirits as they attribute disease to some evil one that has entered the body of the patient neither have they any priests unless a kind of conjurer may be so considered who sings and prays over the sick to drive away the evil spirit on the birth of twins they have a most singular custom which i presume has its origin in some religious opinion but what it is i could never satisfactorily learn the father is prohibited for the space of two years from eating any kind of meat or fresh fish during which time he does no kind of labor whatever being supplied with what he has occasion for from the tribe in the meantime he and his wife who is also obliged to conform to the same abstinence with their children live entirely separate from the others 
a small hut being built for their accommodation and he is never invited to any of their feasts except such as consist wholly of dried provision where he is treated with great respect and seated among the chiefs though no more himself than a private individual such births are very rare among them an instance of the kind however occurred while i was at tassis the last time but it was the only one known since the reign of the former king the father always appeared very thoughtful and gloomy never associated with the other inhabitants and was at none of the feasts but such as were entirely of dried provision and of this he eat not to excess and constantly retired before the amusements commenced his dress was very plain and he wore round his head the red fillet of bark the symbol of mourning and devotion it was his daily practice to repair to the mountain with a chief's rattle in his hand to sing and pray as maquina informed me for the fish to come into the waters when not thus employed he kept continually at home except when sent for to sing and perform his ceremonies over the sick being considered as a sacred character and one much in favour with their gods these people are remarkably healthful and live to a very advanced age having quite a youthful appearance for their years they have scarcely any disease but the colic the remedy for which is friction a person rubbing the bowels of the sick violently until the pain has subsided while the conjurer or holy man is employed in the meantime in making his gestures singing and repeating certain words and blowing off the evil spirit when the patient is wrapped up in a bearskin in order to produce perspiration their care for the rheumatism or similar pains which i saw applied by maquina in the case of thompson to whom it gave relief is by cutting or scarifying the part affected in dressing wounds they simply wash them with salt water and bind them up with a strip of cloth or the bark of a tree they are however very expert and successful in the cure of fractured or dislocated limbs reducing them very dexterously and after binding them up with bark supporting them with blocks of wood so as to preserve their position during the whole time i was among them but five natural deaths occurred to Touche and his two infant children an infant son of maquina and the slave whom i have mentioned a circumstance not a little remarkable in a population of about fifteen hundred and as respects childbirth so light do they make of it that i have seen their women the day after employed as usual as if little or nothing had happened the nutkins in their conduct towards each other are in general pacific and inoffensive and appear by no means an ill-tempered race for i do not recollect any instance of a violent quarrel between any of the men or the men and their wives while i was with them that of yelf lower excepted but when they are in the least offended they appear to be in the most violent rage acting like so many maniacs foaming at the mouth kicking and spitting most furiously but this is rather a fashion with them than a demonstration of malignity as in their public speeches they use the same violence and he is esteemed the greatest orator who bawls the loudest stamps tosses himself about foams and spits the most in speaking of their regulations i have omitted mentioning that on attaining the age of seventeen the eldest son of a chief is considered as a chief himself and that whenever the father makes a present it is always done in the name of his eldest son or if he has none in that of his daughter the chiefs frequently purchase their wives at the age of eight or ten to prevent their being engaged by others though they do not take them from their parents until they are sixteen with regard to climate the greater part of the spring summer and autumn is very pleasant the weather being at no time oppressively hot 
and the winters uncommonly mild for so high a latitude at least as far as my experience went at tassis and kupti where we passed the coldest part of the season the winter did not set in till late in december nor have i ever known the ice even on the freshwater ponds more than two or three inches in thickness or a snow exceeding four inches in depth but what is wanting in snow is amply made up in rain as i have frequently known it during the winter months rain almost incessantly for five or six days in succession End of section 15. Section 16 of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of Nootka Sound by John R. Jewett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was now past midsummer, and the hopes we had indulged of our release became daily more faint for though we had heard of no less than seven vessels on the coast yet none appeared inclined to venture to nootka the destruction of the boston the largest strongest and best equipped ship with the most valuable cargo of any that had ever been fitted for the northwest trade had inspired the commanders of others with a general dread of coming thither lest they should share the same fate and though in the letters i wrote imploring those who should receive them to come to the relief of two unfortunate christians who were suffering among heathen i stated the case of the boston's capture and that there was not the least danger in coming to nootka provided they would follow the directions i laid down still i felt very little encouragement that any of these letters would come to hand when on the morning of the nineteenth of july a day that will be ever held in me in grateful remembrance of the mercies of god while i was employed with thompson in forging daggers for the king my ears were saluted with the joyful sound of three cannon and the cries of the inhabitants exclaiming weena weena mamithli that is strangers white men soon after several of our people came running into the house to inform me that a vessel under full sail was coming into the harbor though my heart bounded with joy i repressed my feelings and affecting to pay no attention to what was said told thompson to be on his guard and not betray any joy as our release and perhaps our lives depended on our conducting ourselves so as to induce the natives to suppose we were not very anxious to leave them we continued our work as if nothing had happened when in a few minutes after maquina came in and seeing me at work appeared much surprised and asked me if i did not know that a vessel had come i answered in a careless manner that it was nothing to me how john said he you are no glad go board i replied that i cared very little about it as i had become reconciled to their manner of living and had no wish to go away he then told me that he had called a council of his people respecting us and that we must leave off work and be present at it the men having assembled at maquina's house he asked them what was their opinion should be done with thompson and myself now a vessel had arrived and whether he had not better go on board himself to make a trade and procure such articles as were wanted each one of the tribe who wished gave his opinion some were for putting us to death and pretending to the strangers that a different nation had cut off the boston while others less barbarous were for sending us fifteen or twenty miles back into the country until the departure of the vessel these however were the sentiments of the common people the chiefs opposing our being put to death or injured and several of them among the most forward of whom were yelf lower and the young chief tuwikaninish 
were for immediately releasing us but this if he could avoid it by no means appeared to accord with maquina's wishes having mentioned to wickaninish i shall briefly observe that he was a young man of about twenty-three years old the only son of tupetchari the oldest and most respected chief of the tribe his son had always been remarkably kind and friendly to me and i had in return frequently made for him daggers chiltooths and other things in my best manner he was one of the handsomest men among them very amiable and much milder in his manners than any of the others as well as neater both in his person and house at least his apartment without even excepting maquina with regard however to maquina's going on board the vessel which he discovered a strong inclination to do there was but one opinion all remonstrating against it telling him that the captain would kill him or keep him prisoner in consequence of his having destroyed our ship when maquina had heard their opinions he told them that he was not afraid of being hurt from going on board the vessel but that he would however as it respected that be guided by john whom he always found true he then turned to me and asked me if i thought there would be any danger in his going on board i answered that i was not surprised at the advice his people had given him unacquainted as they were with the manners of the white men and judging them by their own but if they had been with them as much as i had or even himself they would think very different that he had almost always experienced good and civil treatment from them nor had he any reason to fear the contrary now as they never attempted to harm those who did not injure them and if he wished to go on board he might do it in my opinion with security after reflecting a few moments he said with much apparent satisfaction that if i would write a letter to the captain telling him good of him that he had treated thompson and myself kindly since we had been with him and to use him well he would go it may easily be supposed that i felt much joy at this determination but knowing that the least incaution might annihilate all my hopes of escape was careful not to manifest it and to treat his going or staying as a matter perfectly indifferent to me i told him that if he wished me to write such a letter i had no objection as it was the truth otherwise i would not have done it i then proceeded to write the recommendatory letter which the reader will naturally imagine was of a somewhat different tenor from the one he had required for if deception is in any case warrantable it was certainly so in a situation like ours where the only chance of regaining that freedom of which we had been so unjustly deprived depended upon it and i trust that few even of the most rigid will condemn me with severity for making use of it on an occasion which afforded me the only hope of ever more beholding a christian country and preserving myself if not from death at least from a life of continued suffering the letter which i wrote was nearly in the following terms to captain dash of the brig dash nootka july nineteenth eighteen o five sir the bearer of this letter is the indian king by the name of maquina he was the instigator of the capture of the ship boston of boston in north america john salter captain and of the murder of twenty-five men of her crew the two only survivors now being on shore wherefore i hope you will take care to confine him according to his merits putting in your dead lights and keeping so good a watch over him that he cannot escape from you by so doing we shall be able to obtain our release in the course of a few hours john r jewett armorer of the boston for himself and 
john thompson sailmaker of the said ship i have been asked how i dared to write in this manner my answer is that from my long residence among these people i knew that i had little to apprehend from their anger on hearing of their king being confined while they knew his life depended upon my release and that they would sooner have given up five hundred white men than have had him injured this will serve to explain the little apprehension i felt at their menaces afterwards for otherwise sweet as liberty was to me i should hardly have ventured on so hazardous an experiment on my giving the letter to maquina he asked me to explain it to him this i did line by line as he pointed them out with his finger but in a sense very different from the real giving him to understand that i had written to the captain that as he had been kind to me since i had been taken by him that it was my wish that the captain should treat him accordingly and give him what molasses biscuit and rum he wanted when i had finished placing his finger in a significant manner on my name at the bottom and eyeing me with a look that seemed to read my inmost thoughts he said to me john you no lie never did i undergo such a scrutiny or ever experience greater apprehensions than i felt at that moment when my destiny was suspended on the slightest thread and the least mark of embarrassment on mine or suspicion of treachery on his past would probably have rendered my life the sacrifice fortunately i was able to preserve my composure and my being painted in the indian manner which maquina had since my marriage required of me prevented any change in my countenance from being noticed and i replied with considerable promptitude looking at him in my turn with all the confidence i could muster why do you ask me such a question tyee have you ever known me to lie no then how can you suppose i should tell you a lie now since i have never done it as i was speaking he still continued looking at me with the same piercing eye but observing nothing to excite his suspicion he told me that he believed what i said was true and that he would go on board and gave orders to get ready his canoe his chiefs again attempted to dissuade him using every argument for that purpose while his wives crowded around him begging him on their knees not to trust himself with the white men fortunately for my companion and myself so strong was his wish of going on board the vessel that he was deaf to their solicitations and making no other reply to them than john no lie left the house taking four prime skins with him as a present to the captain scarcely had the canoe put off when he ordered his men to stop and calling to me asked me if i did not want to go on board with him suspecting this as a question merely intended to ensnare me i replied that i had no wish to do it not having any desire to leave them on going on board the brig maquina immediately gave his present of skins and my letter to the captain who on reading it asked him into the cabin where he gave him some biscuit and a glass of rum at the same time privately directing his mate to go forward and return with five or six of the men armed when they appeared the captain told maquina that he was his prisoner and should continue so until the two men whom he knew to be on shore were released at the same time ordering him to be put in irons and the windows secured which was instantly done and a couple of men placed as a guard over him maquina was greatly surprised and terrified at this reception he however made no attempt to resist but requested the captain to permit one of his men to come and see him one of them was accordingly called and maquina said something to him which the captain did not understand 
but supposed to be an order to release us when the man returning to the canoe it was paddled off with the utmost expedition to the shore as the canoe approached the inhabitants who had all collected upon the beach manifested some uneasiness at not seeing their king on board but when on its arrival they were told that the captain had made him a prisoner and that john had spoke bad about him in the letter they all both men and women set up a loud howl and ran backwards and forwards upon the shore like so many lunatics scratching their faces and tearing the hair in handfuls from their heads after they had beat about in this manner for some time the men ran to their huts for their weapons as if preparing to attack an invading enemy while maquina's wives and the rest of the women came around me and throwing themselves on their knees begged me with tears to spare his life and satsatsoxis who kept constantly with me taking me by the hand wept bitterly and joined his entreaties to theirs that i would not let the white men kill his father i told them not to afflict themselves that maquina's life was in no danger nor would the least harm be done to him the men were however extremely exasperated with me more particularly the common people who came running in the most furious manner towards me brandishing their weapons and threatening to cut me in pieces no bigger than their thumbnails while others declared they would burn me alive over a slow fire suspended by my heels all this fury however caused me but little alarm as i felt convinced they would not dare to execute their threats while the king was on board the brig the chiefs took no part in this violent conduct but came to me and inquired the reasons why maquina had been thus treated and if the captain intended to kill him i told them that if they would silence the people so that i could be heard i would explain all to them they immediately put a stop to the noise when i informed them that the captain in confining maquina had done it only in order to make them release thompson and myself as he well knew we were with them and if they would do that their king would receive no injury but be well treated otherwise he would be kept a prisoner as many of them did not appear to be satisfied with this and began to repeat their murderous threats kill me said i to them if it is your wish throwing open the bearskin which i wore here is my breast i am only one among many so many and can make no resistance but unless you wish to see your king hanging by his neck to that pole pointing to the yard arm of the brig and the sailors firing at him with bullets you will not do it oh no was the general cry that must never be but what must we do i told them that their best plan would be to send thompson on board to desire the captain to use maquina well till i was released which would be soon this they were perfectly willing to do and i directed thompson to go on board but he objected saying that he would not leave me alone with the savages i told him not to be under any fear for me for that if i could get him off i could manage well enough for myself and that i wished him immediately on getting on board the brig to see the captain and request him to keep maquina close till i was released as i was in no danger while he had him safe when i saw thompson off i asked the natives what they intended to do with me they said i must talk to the captain again in another letter and tell him to let his boat come on shore with maquina and that i should be ready to jump into the boat at the same time maquina would jump on shore i told them that the captain who knew that they had killed my shipmates would never trust his men so near the shore for fear they could kill them too as they were so much more numerous but that if they would select any three of their number 
to go with me in a canoe when we came within hail i would desire the captain to send his boat with maquina to receive me in exchange for him this appeared to please them and after some whispering among the chiefs who from what words i overheard concluded that if the captain should refuse to send his boat with maquina the three men would have no difficulty in bringing me back with them they agreed to my proposal and selected three of their stoutest men to convey me fortunately having been for some time accustomed to see me armed and suspecting no design on my part they paid no attention to the pistols that i had about me as i was going into the canoe little satsatsoksis who could not bear to part with me asked me with an affecting simplicity since i was going away to leave him if the white men would not let his father come on shore and not kill him i told him not to be concerned for that no one should injure his father when taking an affectionate leave of me and again begging me not to let the white men hurt his father he ran to comfort his mother who was at a little distance with the assurances i had given him on entering the canoe i seated myself in the prow facing the three men having determined if it was practicable from the moment i found maquina was secured to get on board the vessel before he was released hoping by that means to be enabled to obtain the restoration of what property belonging to the boston still remained in the possession of the savages which i thought if it could be done a duty that i owed to the owners with feelings of joy impossible to be described did i quit the savage shore confident now that nothing could thwart my escape or prevent the execution of the plan that i had formed as the men appointed to convey and guard me were armed with nothing but their paddles as we came within hail of the brig they at once ceased paddling when presenting my pistols at them i ordered them instantly to go on or i would shoot the whole of them a proceeding so wholly unexpected threw them into great consternation and resuming their paddles in a few moments to my inexpressible delight i once more found myself alongside of a christian ship a happiness which i had almost despaired of ever again enjoying all the crew crowded to the side to see me as the canoe came up and manifested much joy at my safety i immediately leaped on board where i was welcomed by the captain samuel hill of the brig lydia of boston who congratulated me on my escape informing me that he had received my letter off cluizart from the chief manchi ulatilla who came off himself in his canoe to deliver it to him on which he immediately proceeded hither to aid me i returned him my thanks in the best manner i could for his humanity though i hardly knew what i said such was the agitated state of my feelings at that moment with joy for my escape thankfulness to the supreme being who had so mercifully preserved me and gratitude to those whom he had rendered instrumental in my delivery that i have no doubt that what with my strange dress being painted with red and black from head to toe having a bearskin wrapped around me and my long hair which i was not allowed to cut fastened on the top of my head in a large bunch with a sprig of green spruce i must have appeared more like one deranged than a rational creature as captain hill afterwards told me that he never saw anything in the form of man looking so wild as i did when i first came on board the captain then asked me into the cabin where i found maquina in irons with a guard over him he looked very melancholy but on seeing me his countenance brightened up and he expressed his pleasure with the welcome of wokash john when taking him by the hand i asked 
the captain's permission to take off his irons assuring him that as i was with him there would be no danger of his being in the least troublesome he accordingly consented and i felt a sincere pleasure in freeing from fetters a man who though he had caused the death of my poor comrades had nevertheless always proved my friend and protector and whom i had requested to be thus treated only with a view of securing my liberty maquina smiled and appeared much pleased at this mark of attention from me when i had freed the king from his irons captain hill wished to learn the particulars of our capture observing that an account of the destruction of the ship and her crew had been received at boston before he sailed but that nothing more was known except that two of the men were living for whose rescue the owners had offered a liberal reward and that he had been able to get nothing out of the old man whom the sailors had supplied so plentifully with grog as to bring him too much by the head to give any information i gave him a correct statement of the whole proceeding together with the manner in which my life and that of my comrade had been preserved on hearing my story he was greatly irritated against maquina and said he ought to be killed i observed that however ill he might have acted in taking our ship yet that it might perhaps be wrong to judge an uninformed savage with the same severity as a civilized person who had the light of religion and the laws of society to guide him that maquina's conduct in taking our ship arose from an insult that he thought he had received from captain salter and from the unjustifiable conduct of some masters of vessels who had robbed him and without provocation killed a number of his people besides that a regard for the safety of others ought to prevent his being put to death as i had lived long enough with these people to know that revenge of an injury is held sacred by them and that they would not fail to retaliate should we kill their king on the first vessel or boat's crew that should give them an opportunity and that though he might consider executing him as but an act of justice it would probably cost the lives of many americans the captain appeared to be convinced from what i said of the impolicy of taking maquina's life and said that he would leave it wholly with me whether to spare or kill him as he was resolved to incur no censure in either case i replied that i most certainly should never take the life of a man who had preserved mine had i no other reason but as there was some of the boston's property still remaining on shore i considered it a duty that i owed to those who were interested in that ship to try to save it for them and with that view i thought it would be well to keep him on board till it was given up he concurred in this proposal saying if there was any of the property left it most certainly ought to be got during this conversation maquina was in great anxiety as from what english he knew he perfectly comprehended the subject of our deliberation constantly interrupting me to inquire what we had determined to do with him what the captain said if his life would be spared and if i did not think that thompson would kill him i pacified him as well as i was able by telling him that he had nothing to fear from the captain that he would not be hurt and that if thompson wished to kill him he would not be allowed to do it he would then remind me that i was indebted to him for my life and that i ought to do by him as he had done by me i assured him that such was my intention and i requested him to remain quiet and not alarm himself as no harm was intended him but i found it extremely difficult to convince him of this as it accorded so little with the ideas of revenge entertained by them i told him however that he must restore all the property still in his possession belonging to the ship this he was perfectly ready to do happy to escape on such terms 
but as it was now past five and too late for the articles to be collected and brought off i told him that he must content himself to remain on board with me that night and in the morning he should be set on shore as soon as the things were delivered to this he agreed on condition that i would remain with him in the cabin i then went upon deck and the canoe that brought me having been sent back i hailed the inhabitants and told them that their king had agreed to stay on board till the next day when he would return but that no canoes must attempt to come near the vessel during the night as they would be fired upon they answered wo ho wo ho very well very well i then returned to maquina but so great were his terrors that he would not allow me to sleep constantly disturbing me with his questions and repeating john you know when you was alone and more than five hundred men were your enemies i was your friend and prevented them from putting you and thompson to death and now i am in the power of your friends you ought to do the same by me i assured him that he would be detained on board no longer than whilst the property was released and that as soon as it was done he would be set at liberty at daybreak i hailed the natives and told them that it was maquina's order that they should bring off the cannon and anchors and whatever remained with them of the cargo of the ship this they set about doing with the utmost expedition transporting the cannon and anchors by lashing together two of their largest canoes and covering them with planks and in the course of two hours they delivered everything on board that i could recollect with thompson's and my chest containing the papers of the ship etc when everything belonging to the ship had been restored maquina was permitted to return in his canoe which had been sent for him with a present of what skins he had collected which were about sixty for the captain in acknowledgment of his having spared his life and allowed him to depart unhurt such was also the transport he felt when captain hill came into the cabin and told him that he was at liberty to go that he threw off his mantle which consisted of four of the very finest skins and gave it to him as a mark of his gratitude in return for which the captain presented him with a new great coat and hat with which he appeared much delighted the captain then desired me to inform him that he should return to that part of the coast in november and that he wished him to keep what skins he should get which he would buy of him this maquina promised saying to me at the same time john you know i shall be then at tassus but when you come make pow that means fire a gun to let me know and i will come down when he came to the side of the brig he shook me cordially by the hand and told me that he hoped i would come to see him again in a big ship and bring much plenty of blankets biscuit molasses and rum for him and his son who loved me a great deal and that he would keep all the furs he got for me observing at the same time that he should never more take a letter of recommendation from any one or ever trust himself on board a vessel unless i was there then grasping both my hands with much emotion while the tears trickled down his cheeks he made me farewell and stepped into the canoe which immediately paddled him on shore End of section 16